After all this discussion, we are finally ready to talk about the prep. When we're talking about the prep, our goal is to be as efficient as possible. The diagnosis, of course, plays a significant role in this because you want to start prepping with the end in mind. You don't want to just stick your burr in the tooth, pull it out and see what it looks like, then do a little bit more, then see what it looks like. Plenty of dentists do this and it is horrible and incredibly slow. Your objectives are prep efficiently, which means getting from point A to point B in the most direct path possible. Take as few breaks as possible. If your bird is not cutting, it is a break. If you have to stop and clean the mirror, stop and look at the prep or let the patient swallow, they are all breaks. Now let's talk about the first objective, prepping the two in the most direct path possible. When you're diagnosing a DO versus a DOB versus a DOL versus a DOBL, you should know what the end result looks like you should be able to look at the tooth clinically and see that the tooth, that prep already completed it completely in your mind. Let's talk about a basic slot prep to start. Your first objective means that when you are prepping the buckle wall of the slot prep, once you stick the burr in the tooth, there is no reason to go back and forth like a paintbrush, checking every few passes. You should get the burr in the tooth, take your buckle wall to the extent of what the finished prep should be and break contact. Then you should go to the lingual wall, take it to the extent of your finished visualized prep and break contact. Finally, flatten the floor and clean it up until you have broken contact gingivally. At that point, you should be done. When I prep a tooth, I try to make, a, make note of any remaining decay and consider if it was an error in my diagnosis or a mistake in my prep. Sometimes you just can't see everything on an x-ray and you're gonna have something slightly larger than expected. You can't really do anything about that. However, I have found that most of the time you end up with a little demineralization or caries at the gingival buckle or gingival lingual line angles. So when I make my passes for those two walls, I will flare the burr a little bit, making the floor slightly wider at the base than at the top. Just a little flare with my burr actually improves things quite a bit and eliminates that little bit of demineralized enamel or decay that would often otherwise just remain in that spot. For a basic prep, you just need to make the axial wall deep enough so that you can easily fit any condenser or needed materials in there. You need to take the gingival floor down to where you break contact. The buccal and lingual walls need to extend far enough to break contact. Once those things are done, your prep should basically be complete for a properly diagnosed two surface proximal cavity. Now, if I diagnose the DOL, then I know that I will likely extend the lingual wall just past that breaking contact point. And I'll probably flare the gingival lingual line angle farther to the lingual as well. That is the same for the buckle aspect. If I am doing a DOBL, then I will extend both walls farther than a traditional slot. The goal is to dial in your diagnosing and your visualization of the filling to the point where when you do this, you have just finished the prep. The majority of the time, you may not need to grab a round burr if you have cleaned these things up properly and diagnosed appropriately. The larger the cavity, the more likely you'll have to make one or two passes with a round burr to clean things up. And that's totally okay. We are just talking about the goal and we are striving to hit that as many times as we can. So for that first objective, we are trying to prep the tooth in the most direct way possible, minimizing the need for cleanup passes, either with a high speed a round burr or a slow speed burr. Now, the second part is a focus on minimizing breaks. The objective you should start striving for is to start prepping. And then when you are done prepping, you pull out and rinse and look at it and see if you're done. That is the goal and objective. The better you get, the more often this will happen. I think this is a super fun goal and it adds a little game to prepping fillings. It's really fun to do two or three fillings and do it all in one pass without having to go back for any cleanup. I'm not saying that you have to achieve this every prep, that you never go back, but the more you can do it that way, the faster you'll be and the more fun it is. The burrs and the hand pieces that you use should enable you to do these things. Everyone is a little better, a little different with different tools. I just want to use a bird that is reasonably aggressive so that it cuts fast. And I want to use a bird that is large enough to help me avoid my most likely mistake, which is being a little too conservative. I tend to prep and not quite break contact thinking that it will be fine. And way too often, I try to put the matrix band in and it just doesn't go. For this reason, I'll use a 558 burr, which is taller. So it's very easy for me to gauge the depth of the gingival floor. I know by looking at the burr how deep I need to go and drop it for a molar and how neat, how much I need to drop that for a premolar to break the gingival contact just in the right place. Whatever burr you use, make sure that you memorize those depths 
and measurements so that you don't have to do a second or a third pass because you haven't broken gingival contact. I like the 558 because not only is it reasonably long, but it's also wide enough that it makes it very easy for me to make sure I have broken buckle and lingual contact as well. Now, diamonds work well too. In my hands, the carbides just tend to be a little bit faster with air-driven hand pieces. I might be more inclined to use a diamond if I'm using an electric hand piece, but carbide and air-driven work great for fillings. Now, another thing I would make sure you do is optimize the PSI and ensure your air-driven hand pieces are functioning at or even slightly above the recommended RPM. Some hand pieces can get to 400,000 RPM or even a little more. And if you get that dialed in, it makes a massive difference. Most dental offices are running their air driven hand pieces 20 to 30% below where they should be. If you've ever stalled out on fillings, this is very likely your issue. Obviously, you know this, but air driven hand pieces have speed, but they lack torque. And the electric hand pieces, they have the torque, but lack the speed. I have not found a need for an electric hand piece to do fast, efficient fillings, though it does work great for crown preps. With fillings, you tend to do more precise work, and I don't really want unlimited torque for doing that precise work. I think you might get into more problems. So hopefully that helps you out a little bit. If a 558 is too big for you, you can go slightly smaller, but you might wanna try the 558 because I feel like by the time you lower your burr to the right depth, do a little back and forth, you're already done. It's super efficient at least in my hands.